A deeply divided House returns to the budget drawing board, hoping to find a way out of chaos back to majority rule. Black members of the House become rebels for their cause. We're in New Jersey for a Republican primary. Congresswoman Millicent Fenwick is running for the Senate. Her opponent says the race is a referendum on Reagan. <laughs> From Washington, a weekly report on Congress, a look behind the headlines of the people who are making news on Capitol Hill. The Lawmakers. House leaders are trying again to put together a budget compromise that somehow will command a majority of the 435 members. Last week's first try ended in balkanized disarray with the chamber voting down everything. Tonight, we'll show you what happened and why. Broadly speaking, liberals refused to go along with deep news slashes and social programs. Conservatives refused to accept any big cuts in military spending. Old alliances fell apart as the House divided into splinter groups, none with enough clout to get a budget to its liking. It was a story of political intrigue and confusion, despite the appeals for action. You know, you just can't produce a document, a budget, that will be made in the personal image of each of 435 people because each of us is different. That's what's been great about our country, that we've been able to get some unity out of our diversity. And that's my sermon tonight. Are we able to do that? The trouble was, there was so much diversity that from the very beginning, unity seemed impossible, even though everyone agreed something had to be done about those dazzling deficit figures. 100 million here, 300 million there. You know, as soon as the people around this place start talking that 100 million is a lot of money, it's not a little money. I know it's a multi-billion dollar budget, but most of us think 100 million is still a lot of money. How much money is involved here? It takes out $8 billion in... That is million... <clears throat> Billions, B-I-L-L-I-O-N-S. Billions, not millions. The big issue was priorities, how to divvy up the scale-down federal pie, and the vast array of amendments encouraged splintering, not consensus. With 1982 an election year, everyone wanted something that would pay off at the polls in November, a budget for all reasons. This means meat and potato on a table, it means jobs in a time when the country has one of the highest unemployment rates that we've had in years. This isn't a makeshift jobs uh, like a CETA or anything else. This provides real hardcore jobs. You know, it's a shame that we have to spend so much on defense, but all of us know that it is absolutely necessary. Our country is in no position to negotiate if we're not strong. We cannot negotiate from a position of weakness. Every advocate of the freeze has got to know in their minds, in their hearts, in their spirits, in their guts that now is the time to end this madness. We have to back away from the brink of nuclear disaster. We can have 435 budgets. Each of us can put them up on a banner, go home to our district, claim we have integrity, and let the whole country go down the drain. I find this appalling. Off the House floor, Budget Committee Chairman Jim Jones conceded he had asked for tough decisions at a bad time. All of the choices are second choices. You know, the easiest thing for a politician this close to an election to do, and what he's generally been able to do in the past, is to vote for tax cuts and, and spending giveaways that make people feel good. Uh, now, because of the economic conditions, all of the choices are to either raise revenues or to cut uh, benefits and spending. And those are not easy choices. And unless there is very forceful leadership coming from the president and really creating a drumbeat of support for that, it's very hard to get them to, to say yes to something like that. Voting no was easier than voting yes for most members. In quick succession, the House rejected a series of spending plans put forward by individual groups of liberals and conservatives. The nays are 182, the nays are 242 and the amendment is not agreed to. Some individual amendments for politically popular programs such as veterans benefits and education passed easily. Then came a controversial motion to restore funds for Medicare. 
Democrats added the money to their own budget but refused to help sweeten the Republican plan, prompting moderate Republican Silvio Conte to tear into a Democratic colleague. You you gave your reasons why. Because the leadership whipped you to death and you bled and you cried and you said, Mr. Leader, Mr. Leader, I'm with you. Uh, I don't yield any further. And secondly, he says that he offered an amendment to help the poor people of Medicare. And now he says, because the leadership put the whip to him, the hell with him. Conte's anger subsided the next day when Democratic members did indeed offer a motion to transfer money from defense to Medicare. Budgets are for choosing. The principle that we should go to general revenues for Medicare, that 80-year-old sick women are more important than 40-year-old outdated battleships is an important choice that we ought to make here today. It was the first real test of Republican unity, and moderate GOP members flocked to support the Democratic amendment. I rise in support of this amendment. I speak to my colleagues on my side of the aisle. This is the only amendment that we're going to have the opportunity to vote on to show the senior citizens of this country that we're not going to make our budget cuts in this program. Much to everyone's surprise, the House approved the Medicare motion because of a bizarre political power play. The decision of 65 conservative GOP members to set out the vote as a means of letting Republican leaders know they wanted even deeper budget cuts. More for Medicare meant less for defense, causing conservatives to vote against the entire Republican plan, killing it. This threw everything into chaos with members struggling on late into the night. Somehow, we have to work around the clock. Why? What have we done wrong? What is our sin? I, for one, don't mind uh, staying here until midnight or 2 o'clock in the morning because I find the debate so scintillating, I just can't bear the thought of going home. The question you have to decide tonight is, are you going to pass a budget here and send it on to conference? Or are you going to are you going to go back to the budget and do you think you'll get anything much better out of this process to send over? I know some of you do. Now It wasn't a laughing matter. The divisions were simply too great for an agreement. The House proceeded to turn down both the Democratic budget plan and a middle-of-the-road plan backed by moderates from both parties. A few lone voices still spoke up for passing some budget, any budget. I think they are all lousy budgets. But the fact is that conservatives and liberals alike need to recognize that we have both been licked. And the fact is that this is a product that nobody likes, but we have a responsibility to pass something because all of our people, Republicans and Democrats, rich and poor, need a decision out of this House. After 46 hours of wrangling, the party leaders had lost control of their troops. The House balked at any action despite a final appeal from Speaker Tip O'Neill. But our frustrations will have no match for the frustrations of the American people. If we leave here, we're all tired and frustrated, and I appreciate that. But what a frustration will be out there tomorrow when we leave without a budget. We have a final opportunity, you have a final vote to turn that frustration into hope. I think it is right now uh, polarized and paralyzed, but uh, I don't think it's going to stay that way. I think that. More and more Americans are saying, let's have a ceasefire, let's have a truce in this partisan volleying, and let's uh, get down and pass a budget. Uh, Very clearly, that's the signal I get everywhere I go. And the signal is bringing a new start. The House Budget Committee holding more meetings to plan for a second round battle on the floor next week. Committee Chairman Jones suggested to President Reagan that the Democrats and Republicans split the differences in their two rival budgets. But the president said no a sign the Republicans are still hopeful of getting a conservative-style spending blueprint. But this whole fight has many complications, as Cokie Roberts now tells us. 
Bringing together the various fragments in the House behind a budget won't be easy. In last week's breakdown, the budget literally unraveled at the fringes. Conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats decided not to lie down and play dead for their party's leaders, not to vote for their party's budgets. Liberal Democrats took their cue from the Congressional Black Caucus. Black members had introduced a budget of their own, and they were infuriated when the Democratic leadership told them to go with the Democratic budget, the Jones budget. Well, we were called into a meeting this morning and the position was stick with Jones. We can't stick with Jones. We've got our own work product, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Majority Leader, we have done as much work as Jones with all deference. We've done as much work as any other substitute budget that is before this body. And it's about time we get a little bit of respect or criticism for the nature of our work product. We bring you millions of Democratic votes to the halls of the Congress and to the national ticket. John Conyers' frustration was shared by other blacks who thought their leadership took them for granted, ignored them and the budget document they had labored to prepare.